James Lutton, delighted to be joined on today's episode of Trish Dixon. Uh, Trish, you've recently released and published Warrior, the autobiography for Matthew Saad Mohammed. Uh, that is who today's episode will be about. Uh, first of all, talk to me about the first time you met Matthew. Uh, first time I met Matthew was at the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota. And I was looking at the plaques in the museum and he came up on my shoulder and I said hello and I sort of respectfully said oh you were in a lot of great fights and you know basically thanks for everything that you did for the fight fans and giving us so many memorable wars and then moments later Mickey Duff came bowling over and Mickey had uh he'd had John Conti, Louis Pergo, Lottie Moali, John Conti in the rematch I think and possibly one other that had tried to beat Matthew back in the day and Matthew had beaten all his challengers and they had a joke about how how Duff had lined up all these guys for Matthew to knock off uh, and then it was very strange because it was it was uh I wasn't doing pictures with I had no intention of getting a photo done but Matthew said to Mickey Duff oh this guy's from England as well let's all have a picture and then I think I wound up I think I'm, I don't know if I'm in the middle of that picture but I think there's a picture of me Mickey Duff and Matthew Sar Mohammed grinning like cuddling like we've known each other for years and then we sort of went our separate ways and I sort of saw Matt sporadically through the rest of the Hall of Fame weekend but yeah that was the very first encounter I had with him. Fantastic and obviously all these years later you've you know you've formed a great friendship and you've written his book and all of a, a chance meeting really. Yeah I mean you know there's yeah it was funny I mean even back then you know over that weekend I think he and I had spoken about the possibility of doing a book uh, and he'd, he, you know, been part of Matthew's story as much as anything else, how his story sort of was always going to be destined for Hollywood and all the rest of it because it was such a remarkable tale. So we spoke, yeah, about me doing it, but also about how many chances, uh, you know, that, that it was one of the, you know, people had always said it was one of the best stories never told. And we spoke about that, why not necessarily why it hadn't happened, but we were saying like people have always said it was due to be given the book treatment. So was this the first time that you'd ever spoken to Matthew? So uh, the first time I spoke to him was that time with Duff in the museum. And then that was on say the Thursday morning of the hall of fame, uh, the hall of fame weekend lasts until the Sunday afternoon inductions. Uh, Matthew had already been inducted. I think he was inducted in 97, maybe 98. Um, <clears throat> and so you bump into people through the weekend sort of repeatedly because Canasota is only a small place. Uh, and so each time we would stop to talk. And I think there were fights in the Turning Stone on the Friday night. And I think it was uh, it was Leila Ali against Jackie Frazier. And he and I wound up in the same car going out to those fights. So you just, you know, it's just one of those things where we would spend a bit of time in each each other's company as the weekend went along. And then um, I actually had gone over to America to box at the time. And my first destination, I was tying it in with, uh, with being in upstate New York, was to go to train with Kevin Rooney in the Catskills. And, you know, I wanted to learn the Tyson meth methodology of fighting and, and that kind of stuff. So I said to Matthew, I'm going to go on to Can uh, to Catskill after here. And he said, I'm going back to Atlantic City. But if you ever want to come down to Atlantic City and I'll teach you how to box, I'll teach you to fight down here, I can, I can train you. And I kind of thought, I kind of, you know, my whole thing going over there was I wanted to learn from the likes of Georgie Benton and from... Uh, Emmanuel Stewart, Angelo Dundee, you know, anyone that I could, obviously Kevin Rooney, I wanted to go around all these gyms and learn from and pick the brains of all these people. But then when, well, you know, Matthew gave me his number and, and I said, oh, if I come, if I come down that way, then I will look you up. And I spent about six weeks maybe with Kevin, six weeks, six, Kevin, a couple of months with Kevin. Maybe it was even longer than that, you know. Maybe no, maybe it was closer on three months. Maybe it was June through to September. And um, and then things didn't work out in Catskill the way that I'd envisaged. And um, I went down to Atlantic City and rather than obviously phone Matthew and put all my eggs in one basket and say, "Oh, can I come down?" You know, and, and have any kind of flaky response. 
And I thought, well, let's go to Atlantic City and then make the phone call. And that's kind of what happened. I mean, so in the space of a few days, really, after meeting him, you'd already discussed writing his book, so you clearly hit it off very quickly and got on very well. What was he like as a person? He was a really nice guy, very very trusting. Um, although I think, you know, I think we probably quite promptly established that he was no longer a household name or celebrity and that he'd had a, a bit of a fall from grace and that I was a no-name wannabe fighter. Um, you know, I had a degree in journalism, which is why we could talk about me writing the book. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, you know, I had no other pedigree. I had no writing jobs. I had, you know, this obviously before I'd worked for local papers or written any books or anything else. But, um, yeah, he was, he was trusting. I mean, the one, you know, he was easygoing. Uh, he was modest, extremely modest. And, one thing that he had all the way through, like his life, and if you had this incredible smile, which probably doesn't sound like much, but you would understand how special the smile was if you'd seen it, because it was something that always pe people would always say, whether they were journalists, whether it was his ex wife, whether it was friends, people would always refer to this hugely charismatic smile. He had a very handsome man. And people would just think, you know, what a, what a wonderful smile. And it was a very sort of kind and welcoming so good sense there was a sound behind it too. I want to speak about, obviously, you mentioned a bit of fall from grace. Um, he wasn't a household name no longer. He almost hit rock bottom at one point of his life um, after he retired, of course. And you'd gone out to America and you guys had gone to a fight together and you had some T-shirts made up. Uh, you've, you tell a story in uh, Road to Nowhere, your book that you wrote. Just tell me a bit about that. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was living in Atlantic City and um, I might have mine here, actually. I was living in Atlantic City and uh, obviously very, very skin and very, very poor and really struggling. Um, but I knew how... Uh, desolate Matthew was and he was helping me and you know I wasn't having to pay for accommodation because he was letting me stay with his friends and they were letting me stay at their place uh and so he uh you know as a sort of way of saying thank you I went to a print shop and I had a couple of t-shirts made up that say uh team Saad on the back and they had his gloves well they had just boxing gloves on the front and they said MSM with boxing gloves on the chest and Team Saad on the back. And I've never, I don't know that I've ever actually worn mine, but Matthew was so thrilled with it because he obviously, all his stuff had, was long gone from his career and all his memorabilia and all the rest of it. So, yeah. So it looks something like this <clears throat> MSM with the gloves. If this is just audio, it's not going to work as well, but you can see it. And then Team Saad there. So that's one of two that was made. And it's, uh, as you'd imagine, Fruit of the Loom. Uh, and yeah, I had them made. He was thrilled. And we were going to see Trinidad Hopkins in Madison Square Garden. Matthew drove us up there. And um, a friend of his had had some fake press credentials made and couldn't get in with them. That was for Matthew. I never tried with them because I didn't want to, you know, get in trouble or anything like that. I was only a kid, really. 21, 20. And uh, once they got rejected, we sort of hooked up again by the main entrance. And as as the other guy tried to get in other by nefarious means, I said to Matthew, well, look, you know, I've got this credit card. I think it had like a 200 pound, no, 200, 300 pound limit. No, a 200 pound limit. I think our tickets were $75 each to go into the nosebleeds of Hopkins Trinidad. Um, and that's what we did. We went and sat in the nosebleeds and uh, Matthew had worn his T-shirt up there and I hadn't expected that because obviously it was only a cheap Fruit of the Loom $15 thing, but he liked obviously the way it made him feel again, the fact that he was Matthew Saad Mohammed and a champ and all the rest of it. And we watched the undercard and we saw the likes of Ricardo Lopez and some other great fighters, although there were tiny dots on the horizon because we were sat, you know, there's only about five or six rows behind us, I, I can, from what I remember. 
and um, I let, I went to the the toilet before the main event and came back and Matthew was wearing like a Czech lumberjack shirt and I was thinking well that's that's different like how did he get you know where was that like I couldn't you know I, nothing really nothing malicious had sort of crossed my mind I was just all I couldn't think was like we didn't have anything on us where's that shirt come from and I didn't really think of it about it too much <clears throat> and I think he had like a white vest on underneath or whatever and um anyway we watched Hopkins Trinidad uh Hopkins did great and and obviously made history that night and it was, it was one of the best nights I've been at in any way shape or form because you know so close to uh, it was in the direct aftermath of 9-11 and you know America was riding a wave of patriotism which if you if you were out there at the time you would never forget and like you almost felt a part of America and, and everything else and I was in Atlantic City when the planes went down and I was up on the towers the week before actually with with my ex-girlfriend who'd come out to visit me um, anyway uh, Matthew and I um Matthew, all through that fight, Matthew was kind of wanting to get down to ringside. You know, they announced people like Iron Barkley, Chuck Webner, you know, lesser fighters than Matthew. And and they were sort of, sort of announcing them to the crowd and he was stuck in the nosebleeds with me. And it, so in many ways, it was a bittersweet night, right? Where obviously you see this great fight and you're part of history and, you know, you get to see it all in front of your eyes. But then obviously it was sad because, you know, as you said there, it was Matthew's fall from grace, you know, personified, you know, in a, in a nutshell. And then he drives us back in his Cadillac. God knows how the Cadillac would if he was still able to drive because his motor skills were starting to falter a little bit by that point. And um, on the way back, I said, you know, where's the T-shirt? And he said, oh, I sold it. Um, some guy came up to him and offered him I think it was 15 bucks and the shirt that he was wearing in exchange for the t-shirt. And uh, Matthew said, you know, quite plainly, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't eat the t-shirt. You know, he's got to put food in his mouth. Uh, and so that was it. So now the, I don't, I have no idea where the other t-shirt is, uh, but it was one of two that was made. And the other one is right here with me. Did it make it worse for you? The fact that he was so pleased with it initially on receiving the gift. I mean, the whole thing's horrible, right? The whole thing is, there's no, there's no, it makes it worse. It's just horrible that any, you know, you think of a champion selling his memorabilia is bad, right? And selling his Hall of Fame ring or world championship belts, like that's bad. But when it's got to the depths where you've got to sell a freebie, you know, the first time you wear it, it's just, you know, but then you just don't, you don't appreciate how desperate these guys get, you know, when the well, when, when the well runs dry, you've got to do what you've got to do. And, you know, there's no room for sympathy. Sympathy doesn't put food on the table, right? Absolutely. Uh, and it was, it was, it was a way of me forming a, a level of understanding of what these guys face up to and have to the harsh realities that these guys face in retirement. This is it. And it's, it's not going to be just Matthew, you know, there are other fighters and ex uh, boxers who potentially experience the same thing, you know, with, uh, financial difficulties and and um, whatnot as well. Uh, as I mentioned, you wrote a chapter on him. It's on loop. It's been going on for it's been going on for more than a hundred years, right? It's been going on loop, and it will, it will happen long after you know Matthew died in twenty fourteen. It will happen long after Matthew's gone. Um, you know, a lot of the guys don't know how to look after their money, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, Matthew became a cautionary tale in that respect. Definitely, and it's it's so sad. Uh, situation but like you say it will continue and it won't change unfortunately now as i mentioned you wrote a chapter on him in the road to nowhere why did you write a chapter on him in in that book in particular basically because it kind of explained the window of time as to how i was out there doing what i was doing um <clears throat> you know it's kind of hard to explain to any normal person why I would end up going on a Greyhound bus trying to track down fighters from the 50s and 60s that basically people had forgotten about um, without trying to explain a bit about what I was doing in America in the first place. So he was a crucial part of that that 
metamorphosis really from me being a, a, a young amateur fighter wanting a career as a boxer to being a, a writer and thinking you know that there are other ways to have a career in boxing without me doing the boxing um and yeah so that's why really and and i suppose there was a thing like i suppose with hindsight you know what what i went through with matthew was incredible in terms of i don't know whether you call it access but just being with him and the stuff i'd done with him and experience with him you know like that trip to madison square garden like how many people can say they did that with a with a hall of fame fighter you know where you just wind up in a rickety old cadillac <clears throat> take a two and a half hour journey north to to madison square garden of all places as well you know one of the meccas of boxing to go and watch an iconic fight uh that the fight helped define an era um you know it's it, why wouldn't you include that stuff really um but yeah, I think you know, in terms of you know, Matthew was the bridge, you know, he and he was the constant. He was the, he was the thread, you know. He was Atlantic City for years for me was a base because he was there, you know. I would, you know, if if I was going out on these trips, to <clears throat> to America to find the guys for Road to Nowhere, I would invariably stop in Atlantic City and go and hang out with him, spend some time with him, look him up, and 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 make sure he was, or, you know, try to make sure he was doing okay or whatever it was. So. Yeah, he was he was a he was a common part of it, and I mean, I met, there was a bit in the road to nowhere where Matthew Matthew would um, it introduced me to a friend of his called Willie, and Willie was one of the guys I would stay in his high rise ap uh, apartment for retired veterans deep in the ghetto in a, in Atlantic City, and um, when Matthew went to work one day because he was working for a roofer as a roofer for the union. Uh, I phoned Dwight Mohammed Kawi, who is Dwight Braxton, who had beaten Matthew for the title. And I said to Dwight, I'm in town. <clears throat> I want to come to uh, to interview you in Summers Point where he was living. Uh, can we make it happen? He said, where are you? I said, I'm in Atlantic City. He says, I'll come to you. And I said, well, that's great. Like, how, when can you come over? He's like, I'll come over this morning. And it, you know, I gave him the address. He came over and he sat in the same couch where and did the interview where I would sit with Matthew and watch TV, and then you know a an hour, two hours after interview, you know, I two an hour or so spending it with Dwight Braxton, Dwight Cowie as he became. He would you know the interview was over. He went on and I explained to him that I was living in this apartment and Matthew was here a lot of the time and Matthew would stay over here too, and then when Dwight had left and Matthew came back, I said Dwight Braxton's been here. He's like what here i was like yeah i've interviewed him like he's been here today so even though even though uh yeah so matthew was part of the story like this was a visit that was like a couple of years on i think maybe that was 2003 so that was a, a year on from me first being in atlantic city um so matthew was like a, a constant thread really and i say it's at the start of course it's been a friendship you know for a long long time between the two of you since you met um early 2000s, maybe year 2000, I think it was when you first met Matthew. How often were you in contact? How often would you go and visit him or vice versa? Or would it be telephone calls, et cetera? So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's a, there's a, I try not to give away too many spoilers for Warrior here, but, <clears throat> you know, in, uh, when was it? So it was probably about 2006, 2007. It started to get harder and harder to get hold of him. Uh, you know, he was moving more and more. I think he, he wasn't staying with the same friends that we had known from sort of 2000 to 2004 or five. He'd sort of moved a little bit further north, not back to Philly at this stage, but further north. And I think he was actually training with a guy called Sean Darling, who had the Gladiator Gym in in uh, Forks River in uh, in New Jersey. So he was up that way. So I'd lost touch with him in essence <clears throat> But I would get the odd number for him from uh, friends that I had there, whether they were trainers in gyms or ring announcers or whatever. People say, oh, you know, Matthew's been there. He's sort of asked after you. And, you know, this is the number that he's on. The problem was, obviously, back then, it, it's hard to it's hard to explain what it was like. But <clears throat> a lot of people would have phone uh, a phone. And then, obviously, if there was no credit on it, you couldn't take calls or make calls. And so obviously he was on a phone that didn't obviously always have much credit on it. 
Plus, it got to the point there was a thing with back then where it would be extortionate to for them to pick up a call from the UK. So I could maybe phone him, and then literally his phone would go dead because I used all his credit. Uh, so if he didn't have a landline for me to phone, then I didn't want to use all his credit. So it just became less and less and less. Um, he would phone me less and less as he sort of moved around, and I guess from moved from the old haunts. And you know his struggle was his struggle was real. He had more things to do than phone me and see what I was what I was up to. Um, so we went from it was, you know kind of like a lot of long distance relationships. Really, it was we probably went from calls from fortnightly to monthly to quarterly to six monthly to maybe annually and then 2000 maybe the last time i spoke to him maybe was 2007 or 2008 i guess um and then you know I, I never thought he would i never thought he would um die so young i never and i never thought obviously that i would never speak to him again um but that's the way things worked out well so you you discussed very early on about writing a book uh, with him or about him. Why has it taken so long to publish Warrior? So one of the easiest questions I'll get. Um, <clears throat> so back then, um, he said, oh, can we make this happen? And I said, well, look, I mean, I'm not qualified, um, but I can give it a shot. And... Um, I then reached out to people who knew about writing books, whether it was Don McRae or Dominic Holder Smith and sought advice about what you do. And they said, well, you need to get a literary agent involved because then they take the books to publishers and they try and get people to bid for the rights to the book. So obviously I tried to learn a bit about the process. So I approached a literary agent. I can't, I can't even recall who it was back in the day. Um, it would have been quite a good one because it would have been recommended to me by either Dominic or or Don, um, or maybe even Kevin Mitchell uh, from The Guardian. But uh, either way, I would have taken advice and approached a literary agent. They said, well, do you have proof that this guy is willing to do your, you know, to be in the book or to do the book with you? So this is where I drafted a very sort of haphazard five-line contract or whatever, four or five-line contract, saying I, Matthew Saar, Mohammed, agreed to give Tristix an exclusive rights to my life story. However, the contract reads and took it back to a literary agent. The thing was, you know, um, Matthew was an unknown fighter there. And, you know, he was he was a champ between 79 and 81 on an incredible run from 77 to 81. Um, and we're now looking at 2001. So 20, 20, 20 years removed from his story being at the height. So he's not relevant or topical to anyone. Um, and who the hell am I? Like, I've not written anything. I don't even have a staff job. I've maybe by this point written a handful of stories on websites, you know, maybe got a few lines on Fight News or Boxing Talk or whatever the early websites were at the time. And that was it. So no one wanted to invest in Matthew's story because he'd fallen from grace and no one wanted to invest in me because I had no track record. Um, and that was it. And then, you know, I, <clears throat> there was a, the, you know, and that was from the agent. That was even before we got the idea to take it to, to a publisher. But what I had done, though, James, is through that time, like I hadn't sat idle. So I'd been obviously speaking to Matthew a lot. And we'd, where we talked about getting the book up and running, I was commuting. There was a period of time where I was doing daily commutes for, to, from Atlantic City uh, on the, um, Atlantic City train to Philadelphia, coming out by the library, going to the library and getting all of Matthew's fight reports and interviews and features and previews from the microfilms on the Philadelphia Bulletin, the Inquirer, the New York Daily News. I was going into the library and just ransacking these things and just photocopying them all and I kept everything. So everything's still here. And I was doing interviews with Matthew regularly. We were watching his fights together, you know, the fights with Yaki Lopez, Marvin Johnson. John Conti and I've got his not only have I got interviews of us speaking for you know 45 minutes hour at a time every time um which equated to 20,000 words of a warrior um I've got tape of us watching the fights together getting his reaction as we 
as we watched the fight. So I wound up with loads of stuff. It's just it never happened. And, you know, once I kind of got that pretty hard no from from the literary agent that like, no, it's never going to happen. Or, you know, I couldn't get anyone interested in this or it's too American or you might need to get an American publisher to do it. I also remember actually in the aftermath of 9-11, I phoned up a picture agency saying, um, I can't remember which one, uh, but I phoned up a photo agency in, in America and I said, oh, I'm looking to do a book with Matthew Saar Mohammed, the former boxer. Um, I think you guys have some pictures of him on file. Um, can you can you let me have one for the for for a book to send with a proposal? And the person absolutely tore me a strip off because of Matthew's name, because it was in the aftermath of 9-11 and his name was Mohammed, which was phenomenal. I thought like I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, it was nothing to do with him at all um in any way shape or form but uh yeah so it, it was just a hard no so i mean why and then i suppose then when you asked why did it take so long is you know i didn't re necessarily revisit it for years the thought of it and even you know even when he and i connected i said you know the, the no sort of stayed in my head and nothing in his life had changed to make me think that it was any better or worse a story but um it was only really after <clears throat> after the in the aftermath of the damage and the lockdown coming about where i found my box of matthew's stuff whether it's the t-shirts all the micro cassettes all the photos all the clippings which in this big box to my left of you know which i found in lockdown i started to think well you know i've got a few books under my belt now uh pitch have said they wanted to work with me again so i i sounded sounded out paul from pitch and and he instantly said yeah we'll take it um so that's that's why it was so long so long a gap really um you know when matthew passed in 2014 it didn't occur to me then to revisit it i mean i think <clears throat> by then i probably only written um ricky hatton's book with him i'm not even sure that road to nowhere had been out by then if it was it was it was probably around about that time so uh i didn't I, even then i didn't have the pedigree that anyone would have wanted um and it only you know it only came years later obviously like i said in that first lockdown where it, it became a, a a bit of a bit more of a mission and how that actually worked yeah i found this box of stuff and then i sat down on my laptop and i thought well you know what? let's see what's actually in here because it's going back a couple of decades now and then i was just overcome with emotions of sentimentality nostalgia happiness a little bit teary in bits um, and everything just came out. And I think it, within about within about two hours, I'd written about 6,000 words and I was quite happy with it. And I was thinking, you know, this, I'm not going to say this is pretty special, but it felt quite special to me in terms of what I'd written. Um, I'm not going to say it, I've written something special, but I've, I put, I've written something that felt special to me. Um, <clears throat> and I thought, you know, I've got that there and then I then I transcribed the tapes and I realized I had 20,000 words of interviews on tapes so I was like this is you know I've got a lot done here um and plus I had all the research here all the clippings all the microfilms and stuff so um I thought why not let's do it let's you know I made the promise to him let's do it you mentioned earlier you last spoke to him about 2007 2008 and I could almost hear the emotion in you when you said that um, you didn't expect him to pass away. You know, you didn't expect to ever speak to him again. Um, things like that. Do you feel this book was almost sort of closure for yourself? Was it something that you had to do? Do you feel any sort of thing like that at all with this? Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think you're right with what you said to that, James, because that's something that um, <clears throat> I thought at the start of the project, um, and I thought at the end of the project, um, and I still feel it now when I see copies of the book um, around, I, you know, I do feel like it's uh, it's a, it is closure for, for me. Um, and I felt that's probably one of the reasons why I felt so raw and emotional when I did start typing is because there were some open wounds, I guess, you know, whether we and I'm not quite sure whether it was, whether whether it was because I didn't ever have the chance to say goodbye to him or um because i nearly did i was going out to the hall of fame in 2014 and he died like two weeks before the week before so I, it it could have been that i nearly 
either had the chance to see him or had the chance to go to the funeral and neither neither aligned up neither lined up with with the job i had at the time at boxing news um so i don't know if it was that or just whether that you know it was the contract and the promise that you know i'd do the book or that i wanted to do it justice or, or anything else but yeah closure is definitely a, a fair way of saying it. it felt like it was closure i mean there's still you know i can't say it's it hasn't cut off all my emotions to matthew and the story um but it does feel like i've fulfilled a and i don't want to say obligation because that's too business like but and maybe a promise i don't know is it a promise i don't know it's it feels like it feels like i fulfilled something that we'd set out on together absolutely and i'm going to end on the same question i ask at the end of every pod episode what's your favorite memory that you spent with matthew hmm. i've got a funny one i don't know if it's a favorite one and it is in the it is a warrior so it's a bit of a spoiler but so Back in the day, we went to uh, <clears throat> some fights in Wilmington, Delaware. Diane Fisher was promoting, and it was the last fight of Tracy Patterson's career. And uh, there was um, there was uh, a women's fight on the undercard. And obviously, I like I said, I alluded to I was in hard times at the time. I had no money or or anything else. And uh, Diane Fisher asked me to be a round card guy for the women's fights. Um, and so, you know, top came off, all round, ring card, showing everyone. And I'd gone with Matthew, Ray Mercer, I think Brian Nielsen was there, Sparring Mercer, T Thomas Damgard. There was a whole bunch of us that had gone. And I remember them trying to talk me up, trying to say, oh, you know, you'll be really good at this. Like, you know, like just because I wasn't confident. I was, I was 20, 21 and whatever. And I was thinking like, God, I don't want to do this, but she'd offer me, I want to say like, not a hundred bucks, but there's some money in there. And, uh, and I had Mercer and Matthew saying, go on, you know, do it, like, do it, like you're encouraging me to do it. And I got up there, top off, holding up the round card and Mercer and Matthew and all the others started booing the house down and they were heckling me, telling me to get off telling me that I was, you know, oh, I can't remember what they were shouting, but they were heckling me. And I was like, oh my God, this, I just want the world to swallow me up. And then when I stepped out between the ropes, I looked at them and they were all sort of laughing at me. I was just like thinking, please, can someone get knocked out in the next round? Because I don't want to have to go through this again. Fantastic. And it's something you'll never forget. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's brilliant. Chris, I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you for speaking to us today. No worries. Thanks for having me, James. No problem at all.